background. You have my contact information in front of you. Uh, I answer email pretty quickly, Randy at T2E or Randy J at NMGI.com. And if I'm available, I do pick up the phone. So I've been around doing technology for a while. I started a policy uh, five years ago that the granddaughters always get a picture shown when I speak. So the two in the middle, uh, Adeline and Olivia, and on the outside edge, you've got Ava and Kinley. But uh, basically for a, a family event, we just uh, grabbed a quick photo. I do have my NMGI company, which uh, supports CPA firms 24 by 7 from Boston to Honolulu, 35 nifty people there that understand technology and accounting firms as well as my K2 business, we're producing around 1,150 events across the U.S. and Canada, another 25 people there or so. So I've got to tell you, a lot of things I talk about come from those 60 or so people, and we have websites to support a lot of the things that we're going to talk about there. So you're certainly welcome to visit our K2 site and get additional information that way. So the way this is going to roll today is I'm going to talk a little bit about the survey, the respondents, and the major findings uh, over the next 20 minutes or so. Again, it's a several hundred page book and its results. And uh, again, you're welcome to take this and get a full free copy when it comes out. We had a pretty extensive survey of about 86 questions. We really were focused on this technology area. Uh, we were not after HR and management items. And most of the responses were gathered in the fourth quarter. Uh, we invited from several different sources, including uh, Accounts World Invitations and uh, print media and online stories and others. And uh, then uh, the, the respondents got a survey of uh, these results. So we had 632 firms answer all of those questions. They ranged in size from sole practitioners to 1 to 10 employee groups up to 11 to 50 and 51 plus. And, uh, you know, at this point, I think I'd like to make sure all of you are tracking with me. Remember, we've got polling questions you need to respond to today. So, John, if you could uh, fire that first polling question up. And the polling question that basically says, what should we expect from a cloud implementation? A specific function sometimes shared by more than one user, that it supports your computing strategy? that it protects or enhances your computing strategy or all of the above. What do you think there? I know we want to give uh, the majority of you the time to respond, so Jonathan will be watching that for just a minute. Now, in the time together, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how firms are using technology. Cloud technologies is one of those. Uh, fortunately, uh, I was an early proponent. Dr. Monsaldi was an early proponent of using uh, cloud techniques starting in the 90s, in his case with products in the, in the 2000 timeframes. Uh, we also completely understand there are certain uh, products and certain strategies where you're going to want to run things in-house. So uh, we now use a mixture of in-house and cloud. I call that hybrid technology. We'll talk about that as well. So Jonathan, what have you found there? Okay, Randy, I'm going to uh, close the poll and share the results. And it looks about 92% uh, agree that it's all of the above. Yeah, we thank you very much. We do uh, believe that all of those are benefits for, for cloud technologies. So in the technology management uh, survey, you can see that we basically have respondents from uh, all over the United States. And uh, the breakout looked roughly like this, from sole practitioners all the way up through larger firms. And you can see we had pretty substantial increases year over year. We knew we were statistically valid, by the way, at about 275 responders. So this year's mix being much stronger was good for us. And uh, when we look at the uh, you know, firm size comparison, you can see we had a, a few less sole practitioners uh, this year, but more in the 1 to 10 employee range. So some of the questions that I thought were use, worth using some of our time today were the biggest tech challenge. And I've included the results across all of the different um, sizes, as well as this year, last year totals. And I've highlighted one in particular that uh, caught my attention, workflow and efficiency. Firms of all sizes seem to be focusing around uh, workflow as a pretty big challenge right now. 
getting clients on board and working with the firm in a more digital way uh, is certainly another big one. And then the, uh, I guess we'll call them tied for third, the paperless and uh, effective technology strategies came in as well. Now in terms of the services, the growth services uh, were pretty interesting. Collaborative accounting and bookkeeping uh, we showed up in more firms in this result. The business consulting was up and payroll was up. Uh, and even across the whole mix, you'll notice that we had more uh, tax prep and planning. Uh, interestingly enough, some of the declining services, including financial planning or wealth management, some of the forensic work, uh, a decline in international, a decline in offering technology services, and then there was another category which has a rather interesting mix of additional services. In terms of the top three challenges of managing the firm, these results were also interesting. Attracting new clients uh, in all sizes of firms seemed to be uh, one of the biggest items. Uh, identifying opportunities for practice improvement and cost savings uh, was another. And again, you can read the rest of the results from here, but managing workflow again showed up third in terms of the different items. In terms of the top three tech challenges, keeping up with new software was number one. And behind that was the cost of purchase with workflow uh, coming in down there at about number four or so. But notice that that seemed to be a theme throughout. Again, I thought it was convenient for you to have all of these results for your review uh, just so you could see what other firms uh, of your size might be doing. When we asked the question about how uh, tax returns were delivered, the most popular answer was paper copy at the office with the second most popular being paper via, via U.S. mail. So that still means a good number of firms are in fact delivering tax returns via paper. But then uh, another answer really did bother me. 20% of sole practitioners said that they were emailing tax returns, and when we dug on this, without encryption. Uh, larger firms were also emailing tax returns without encryptions, and you can see the numbers there, 13 half, 7 half, 16.7. And so the bottom line here is there's a number of firms that are emailing tax returns without encryption, without using portals and so forth. That's a real problem as we see it. The, that really led me to the portal question, or question 31, and you can see that about 60% of the firms have a portal out there, but the amount of usage is still fairly low. Uh, practitioners point out that the interface with the, the clients, the uh, maintenance of the users, other factors like that really still keep them from being broadly adopted. Uh, I was one of the first proponents to use multiple monitors, two, three, four. In fact, the system that I'm running off of today has four monitors on it. But our new recommendation for this year, 2015 and beyond, is to return to a single large monitor or two very large monitors. Particularly with Windows 10, the ability to snap the applications into the corners now, we're thinking that a 32 to 34 inch monitor is better than having multiple monitors. You did not hear Randy say replace monitors, but in your future purchases by bigger monitors, you'll see that later in the presentations. But right now, about 25% of the firms are running one monitor, about 50% two, and about 25% three. We're going to encourage that to go back towards one. Some of the other uh, applications that were fairly mundane, but I thought these would just be uh, of interest, the adoption of um, the latest versions of Microsoft Office with 2013 and with uh, Office 365, you'll notice about 40% of small practitioners were on these two most current versions. Uh, if you look at the entire load, again, it's about 40% across the entire board. So uh, about uh, you know 40% of all firms, it looks like, are very current on their Microsoft Office products. Remember, though, this is 2015. Server 2003 has to be replaced before July 15th. And anything that is XP or older, or anything that is Office 2003 or older, are all security risks and need to be replaced in your firm. Next up was hey, uh, Randy, yes. Jeff, real quick. Uh, we're having a uh, little bit of an audio problem. Or, uh, maybe you might need to get a little closer to the mic if possible. 
Sorry, to, sorry, sorry to interrupt. No, but, uh, as a matter of fact, I appreciate that. So I'll, I'll yeah. pick it up just like this and see if that helps for a little bit. And, oh, yeah, uh, much better. Thank you, Randy. All right, we can do that. Uh, so, you know, the next piece was the uh, piece about 1040 work paper scanning. Uh, there are about seven products out there, but there are really only three that we recommend at this point. You will note from the result, though, that uh, about a third of the firms say we're not using any sort of 1040 work paper product. And the ones that are using them have a mix of CCH Scan or Copanion Gruntworks or Docket. Uh, Drake, by the way, is probably using Copanion Gruntworks. And then you can see a little bit of the uh, Thompson usage and the Lacert Tax Scan and import. So uh, still much opportunity, we think, in the 1040 marketplace. Uh, document management systems, a little better adoption here, but many are doing uh, do-it-yourself or tend to be on smaller file cabinet versions of products. So no one real dominant player here other than maybe the do-it-yourself methodology or the, uh, the Thompson file cabinet CS that's included with so many of their products. In terms of workflow software, at the high end, it was pretty clear to us that uh, XCM was being used pretty frequently, and that Thompson's firm flow was being used by firms that had go file room. In the mid markets, we saw a little bit more of the XCM product. But, uh, you know, in this particular category, small firms, uh, you know, indicate that and they either don't have or they are considering at uh, much higher rates than we saw in the prior year. Uh, you can really see it in this particular slide where it says none we are considering was 3.1% uh, for overall last year, and it's 23% this year. Such a huge move in workflow. We believe that this decade is the decade of workflow, and it can really help with realization in the firm with workflow efficiencies and so forth. In terms of tax products being used, uh, again, this particular mix is a snap of this base, but you can see ultra tax by about 20%, pro system tax at about 17 and a half, uh, and then Drake. We understand, and then Lasort, by the way, is at 11, but we understand our sample uh, tends to be a little smaller firm size, but as far as the market goes, we understand that most of the uh, firms in the U.S. market are smaller. In terms of engagement managers, uh, you'll note that uh, CCH engagement is the dominant player here. Uh, engagement CS is probably the second most common case where being third. That's not to ignore that there's a number of firms just using Excel and Microsoft Office and doing their own work papers more or less manually. There is a new player in the marketplace, the Advanced Flow product, which uh, surprisingly got pretty good uh, traction in the first year out. We believe that there's a lot of opportunity for firms around write-up, bookkeeping, collaborative accounting. Uh, I, I help start a lot of the uh, collaborative accounting. Obviously, uh, uh, you know, the key players here include Accountants World, one of our sponsors. Intuit's got some things here. Thompson has some offerings here and so forth. And you can see the percentages of uh, adoption among firms in write-up and bookkeeping. Now, uh, these numbers may or may not have made it to your uh, presentation. I hope that they did. Um, we did a little bit of research as of late because of so much being said about how many seats are being used in these different collaborative accounting products. You know, uh, obviously ZeroCon is holding their event in Denver today. They have about 475,000 seats. Intuit, of course, has made an awful lot of push around uh, their QuickBooks Online at 841,000 seats. And then you've got other players like FreshBooks and Wave that have 5 million and 1 million. Frankly, what sent me down this path was the announcement that FreshBooks had 5 million users for Schedule C clients, and I was really you know, pretty surprised at that. So we are seeing more adoption of these SaaS accounting products. Uh, I think the Accountants World folks have had their products out for about uh, 20 years at this point, so certainly a solid 10 in the most recent versions. So in any case, I think it is time for our second question. So let's take a quick look at uh, this question. Uh, so Jonathan, if you could launch the polling question, what are some of the top technologies for firms? Uh, cloud hosting, workflow, collaborative accounting, 
all of the above. Now remember, you do need to uh, respond to the polls to be able to get your CPE credit. And while you're thinking about these, um, you know, I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the top technologies because if you've got a solid practice management product in place, you know, you've got your document management workflow tax, one of the profitable areas that you can have is um, you know, addition of collaborative accounting. We frequently recommend that you add uh, payroll as a service in that area. Uh, I just wrote a payroll article which will be published over about the next 30 days or so. Uh, you know, if you'd like a preview of that, uh, you know, let me know. But I, I do believe that trying to take care of clients with tools that help their business is a pretty important deal. Now you may say, Randy, our firm strategy is such that we don't want anything to do with collaborative accounting or payroll, and I understand that. What I'm trying to do is say, what would help your clients most, what is profitable for the partners, and what raises the value of the, of the practices for the long term. So I believe, Jonathan, it looks like it's slowed down. Have you got some results for us, please? Sure, Randy. I'm going to uh, close the poll and share the results. And it looks like 75% agree that it's all of the above. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in this case, I probably could have listed even more top technologies, but I think all of these uh, come into play. So, uh, you know, a few final closing things off of the polls. Uh, you know, it's also pretty clear that uh, practice management no dominant player here, CCH practice management, practice CS, and uh, QuickBooks being there. But notice 27% of you uh, were not using any sort of uh, practice management or time billing app whatsoever. I've included the details also across a broad number uh, of the products at this point. Uh, further, payroll uh, went all over the map as well. Uh, you can see a few of the dominant players here. Uh, one of the, the um, things that I'd like for you to know about is that the uh, Accountants World Payroll Relief is one of my favorite payroll products, and you can see that this is a you know pretty good sized uh, player in the small to mid markets. But this different list of payroll companies, I think it's growing all the time, and there's plenty of opportunity for you in there. We were also somewhat surprised that. Uh, 20% of the responders did not subscribe to any sort of tax research. Uh, Checkpoint was about a third of the market and IntelliConnect was about 20%. But beyond that, it, it was amazing to us how many still use paper books and how many just depended on internet searches to get this uh, tax research done. And then beyond that, uh, the client accounting results I thought were also insightful in terms of who was using what uh, right now from a CPA firm perspective. And then likewise, what was being used for the firm's accounting. No surprise that there was some overlap in those areas. So, you know, in terms of uh, allowing the firm to show real-time availability. These are presence indicators. I use them in my own business. But you'll notice that right now, the, the results basically show no or none being used. About 6% through uh, the phone system, and about 5% through instant messaging. So to me, this was still a pretty good um, opportunity to apply a piece of technology, to use a presence indicator, which many of you will inherit simply by using Microsoft uh, Office. Then the next question uh, that I wanted to just pull in was question 76. How likely are you to uh, implement a web-hosted cloud-based software as a service uh, version of your firm's tax and accounting application over the next two years? And you can see it was a pretty mixed bag, pretty flat, uh, response across all sectors. You can see 12% had already done and 17% uh, had basically said it was not very likely. So we included those details for you as well. Uh, we did ask questions about the technology purchasing budget. Um, not surprising based on the size of the responders, 
85% of the firms were working with no budget, and their logic was they just spent whatever they needed to when it came up. If, in fact, there was a budget uh, in what was actually spent, the numbers varied, you know, uh, as you can see, between 1 and 2,000, 2,000, 4,000, and so forth. The rule of thumb still applies for technology budget purchasing, though. 5 to 7% of top-line revenue seems to hold uh, pretty close. And uh, then we ask about the factors uh, about recommending a vendor's product or service. And again, this one was pretty clear. Uh, I know others would benefit from working with a vendor, that they get great client service, and that they're trusted. Those were pretty straightforward, not a surprising answer uh, on those. So we have included uh, a couple of uh, factors from each different size firm in terms of what was deemed to be effective at generating revenue and what was deemed to be not effective. And I thought it might be helpful for you to note in the medium and large firms that in the not effective category was the social media piece. You'll notice that in all firms, one up, that marketing and advertising also didn't seem to be effective. So I don't know that these are correct answers, but I do know that there are what other firms believe is happening. And honestly, with that in mind, I think they have to be true for each one of those firms that responded. So I think this, uh, this detail chart and the next one will also be helpful to you. This was about what is effective to control cost and what wasn't effective to control costs. And you'll notice that raising fees was deemed not effective at controlling costs. Um, there were some other pretty interesting items that were revealed in these particular charts. So again, I'm not trying to read the whole survey to you. What I wanted to do was pull some things out that gave you a flavor of what's going on in technology and firms. And again, you can uh, pick up the whole guide if you'd want. So now I'm going to change tone. You know kind of what's going on with firms around you. What are some things that I'm going to recommend that you do? I have 10 very straightforward items for you to watch first. First, licensing. Microsoft, Adobe, and others are being very aggressive with their annual renewals of licensing, and I'd like to make sure that you keep your firm on the straight and narrow when it comes to licensing. We don't think it'll be a one-time event. We think it'll happen frequently, once every three years. So I'd like for you to get licensing into your budgets as a normal cost of doing business. Don't violate the license agreements. Next, we see training deficiencies throughout firms. The survey indicated that this year as well. Uh, think about what really works for your team members in terms of training. If it's CPE, fantastic. If it's not, at least put training in front of them that is applicable to their job. It helps them uh, uh, satisfy a task or advances their career. Be very thoughtful about your learning plans. I think most firms are not spending enough time or effort, maybe money too, on training. Third, uh, being able to get to your work anywhere, anytime, any device. We call that AAA sometimes, but it's really about remote access or possibly, if you're larger, virtual desktop infra infrastructures. We'd like for you to be more thoughtful about how you can work anywhere, anytime. If you've got an all SaaS solution, like Accountants World has, you can run entirely out of browser. If you are using an all hosted solution, like at Eccentric or Cloud9 or Thompson's Virtual Office or CCH Access, you've got remote access that way. Or you may say, look, Randy, I really want to keep everything internally. I want to build my own private cloud. And you can do that quite well using Citrix, uh, Citrix Essentials in specific, or VMware uh, Horizon View. I don't believe you're as well served if you're using uh, RDS or what used to be called terminal services. Uh, researchers are indicating almost 50% of all computing spend will be in remote access and VDI. We think it's important to have consistency in your processes and workflow. Uh, we know that if you do this, you'll uh, deliver more consistent and better work products to clients, and your profitability will go up per partner. We also understand that in some firms, though, 
each partner wants their work done their way, so it's going to be very hard for you to get consistency in process and workflow, but I think it is worthy of some review. We also are concerned about governance, uh, including the now 22 different uh, regulatory things that apply to accounting firms that have a technology bent. Of course, we've had a lot of news uh, of the Patriot Act allowing that to expire over the past little while, but there's a new act that's supposed to go in force about three weeks from now, so we're still going to have Patriot Act uh, Section 215-like considerations. We've got HIPAA, we've got 7216 and so forth. Watch the governance for yourself and for your clients. Uh, next, we think it's important that you really do get your marketing of initiatives done uh, appropriately and coordinated properly. Uh, we think it's wise to use electronic document management and portals. We are very disturbed about paper delivery of returns and email delivery of returns and the security that's around those and the time inefficiencies that's around those. We want you to uh, continue to watch for communication issues. You're going to discover that data lines are going to continue to drop. You'll have actually more issues around voice quality as I see it, and uh, there will be changes over the next five years in these areas. Uh, we also want you to be aware of and control risks on mobile devices, including some thoughtful internal controls around your data. How do you preserve your data for the firm? How do you keep it from leaking out into the open environment? See, many users of Office 365 or Windows uh, 10 or Windows 7 and 8 are automatically synchronizing data into the cloud without maybe that being your policy. And we were really saddened a year ago to start having to recommend the consideration and purchase of cyber insurance. But much like antivirus of the uh, you know, 1980s, we now think that it's not a matter of if you'll get hit, but a matter of when with some sort of a cyber attack. We also believe that many firms are using older technology, including older firewalls and switches and fans and other pieces that are really a problem. So knowing that that's the case, those are the things that I'd like for you to uh, watch for. So, um, you know, I think what I'd like to do, Jonathan, if we could launch the question, you know, what's required whether in a public or private cloud? Let's go ahead and do an extra polling question right now. Sure, Randy. Thank you for that. Okay, the poll's been launched. All right. So you'll notice I want you to be, uh, you know, thoughtful about this because it doesn't really matter whether you're in a public cloud or a private cloud, whether you're using, you know, a complete SaaS solution or that you've got things running in-house. What do you have to have? And you'll notice I've listed, you know, firewalls, good connectivity, computers, all of the above. What do you think? And as you're thinking that through, notice that it really doesn't matter whether you're in-house or out-of-house, you have to have all of these things. So it looks like the responses have slowed down. So Jonathan, you think they're there with us? Absolutely. I'll close the poll. All right. And then I'll share the results. I appreciate that. And it looks like 89% uh, agree that it's all of the above. Yes. So we do agree. You need a strong firewall. You need good connectivity, the point that I'd recommend that you have two lines. Computers, as it turns out, is probably the most marginal answer uh, among the list there, uh, but you really need all of the above to be effective. All right, so what I'm going to do next is just come over into a few technology items. Again, those of you who have attended my sessions uh, here with Accountants World for some years know I do a lot on very technology specific items. I have quite a number of slides that we'll go through quickly on monitors uh, because the monitor recommendations are changing. What's caused that? Curved monitors, 4K monitors, 5K monitors, 3D monitors, touch portable. And so we really think the days of two, three, and four monitor recommendations are coming to a close. So, uh, you know, here I am at CES this year with a curved Samsung monitor. That's a 32 inch Samsung monitor and uh, you can look at other vendors here for example is an HP uh, 34 inch curved monitor 
its retail price is $9.99, but it's selling for about $900. When I compare that to the cost of two or three monitors, uh, this becomes pretty attractive. I don't have the vertical bar in the middle uh, or vertical bars from the outside edges of the screens, plus the gentle curve keeps the screen at the same focal length for me. We also have a number of touch monitors that are working quite well. So you can see the Dell Touch here at $399 is another example of that. And there's other vendors like Planar and so forth that have these as well. So when you think about the result we looked at earlier about auditors and working from the field, you need mobile monitors. And there's a number of mobile monitors available, Asus, um, mobile monitor from MMT is another product we like very well. Uh, HP has a number of products, the 160s and the 140s, but notice at $139 for the 160, no power supply required, that's a pretty interesting second monitor. So for many of you, you can use an Ultrabook and a secondary monitor and wind up with a uh, reasonably uh, light more portable solution than just having a bigger computer. Also, if you've got people that are working out of the office, this looks bigger than it is. It's actually about the size of a, a thick cell phone. Uh, this is a wireless access point that can do both wired and wireless, as well as cellular. So you can use a single device to share connection among a team of two or three or four people that are uh, you know, out on a client site. Or if for some reason you'd have a failure in your office, you could use this as a backup within the office itself. A number of you should be looking at routers for your home as well. These wireless access points are all now compatible with the new 802.11 AD standard which is beginning to arrive, but they are today all AC routers. These are much quicker than the typical wireless access points that you've had in your home, and all of these are what we consider home grade gear, not business grade gear. The business grade gear, that's still gonna come from the likes of the Cisco's and the Sonic Walls and so forth, but these possible replacements for your homes but vary between about $150 and $300. Uh, the ones that we like are about $200. But as it turns out, you will get much better performance in your home, and you'll get much better security if you'll consider uh, replacing some of your wireless access points. Now, another thing that's changed pretty notably year over year is the types and recommendations that we make in scanners. Uh, Many people in the press recommend the uh, Fujitsu ScanSnap scanners, and many of you own those. And again, remember, we're not trying to get you to throw away gear that you have, but in general, we don't recommend ScanSnap for CPAs or accountants because they are, uh, they don't, their, the productivity is not there. They're not as productive as using these other types of scanners. So the issue here is that we're looking for scanners that have automated software interfaces into our document management systems, our portals, our 1040 work papers, and so forth. And to do that, you have to have Twain interfaces. Twain stands for technology without an interesting name. Now, that acronym is really important because it saves you steps every time that you do a scan. So in the Fujitsu line, we like the 7160s and the 7180s, for example, but they tend to be more of a office-based uh, class scanner. They're the replacements for the old 6130s and, and uh, 6230s that were out there. Another vendor that uh, we like their offerings, we like the price points and so forth, is Canon. Uh, they've released the C225 and the 225W, as well as the DRM162, which are both very nice uh, scanners. The first one we think is appropriate for use in the field. The second one we think is appropriate for use in the office. Or the P215-2, which are all, is also a portable unit. All of these scanners include cleanup software. In the case of Canon, they provide COFAX VRS. 
in the case of Fujitsu, they've now written their own cleanup software called PaperStream IP, and they no longer have a relationship with Kofax BRS. So the key here uh, is we would like for you to think at, about and look at some of these newer generation scanners, which have the Twain interface and include Kofax VRS. So I know this picture isn't the greatest, but this 225 or the 225W is less expensive than a ScanSnap. It's the same speed, it has Twain, and it has Kofax VRS, making it a real bargain as I see it. This Scantini is about the same size as a ScanSnap S300, or sorry, 1300. It is less money, it has Twain, it does the same speed. Again, I, I have a hard time not using this uh, simply because it's so much of a better value. So our rule of thumb from all of the big scanner providers right now, whether it's Fujitsu or Canon, the current models are in black, the old models are in white right now. So you can see it here, the ScanSnap iX500 is the current model, but there's the 7160 that I like, or the 7180 that I like. The other models that are in white, those need to be avoided. They're older technologies. The same thing is true when you look at a Canon full line. Well, I think we had best launch an additional poll. So um, we probably have talked about this earlier enough to ask it. So Jonathan, if you could add, launch the question, what are the three cloud approaches that are out there? Sure, Randy. What are the three cloud approaches? Thank you. Okay, the poll has been launched. Thank you very much. So what are the three cloud approaches? You can do hosted, you can do SaaS, you can mix things together, that's called hybrid, or you can do all of the above. And uh, Jonathan, we'll let you kind of watch that for when it's slowing down. Again, our goal is we'd like all of you to answer all the polls so you qualify for the CPE. Okay, it looks like it slowed down. Um, let me close the poll and share the results. All right. And it looks like uh, 97. I appreciate that. Oh, no problem. It looks like 97% agree that it's all of the above. Yeah, understood. So thank you for doing that. All right, just a few other technologies, if I could then. Um, in the new generation computers, using the new generation monitors, you're going to need to have new generation docking stations. Unfortunately, the big vendors, HP, Lenovo, Dell, their docking stations don't have enough resolution to drive the big monitors. So we're going to recommend uh, a few different docking stations while the vendors play catch up. Targus's ACP 71 USD 4K dock does a beautiful job of supporting the really high resolution monitors. It has some other new technologies in it, $153. If you carry a lot of um, portable technology, cell phones, tablets, and the like. You need the ability to charge those devices uh, effectively. If you put a, a powered hub like the EC technology powered hub on your laptop or desktop in the office, uh, you'll get recharging power plus 15 USB ports for $50. It's really a great bargain. We think over time we'll probably recommend the Warpia down below, which has not been released yet, as a potential additional docking station that also happens to have powered USBs for recharging purposes. But for now, the Targus plus the EC seems to be our best uh, option. So I think it is probably appropriate that we ask another polling question, kind of rapid fire on that. So uh, Jonathan, if you wouldn't mind launching the what are some of the cloud rewards question? Sure, Randy. Okay, poll has been launched. Thank you very much. And this question, what are some of the cloud rewards? You can overcome local IT knowledge deficiencies. You can minimize your 
infrastructure capital costs. You can have less maintenance at the desktop level or all of the above. And while you're reflecting on that, uh, you know, from my perspective, you should do what's in the best interest of your firm. If you believe that you should stay premise-based, make sure that you've got firewalls and switches and cabling right, and that you've enabled remote access if you want people to be able to work from afar with something like Citrix Essentials or Horizon View. If you believe you can use uh, an all-in-one uh, type of solution, and I'm going to pick on Accountants World here with the uh, you know, the Power Practice tool. Notice that they have everything in their product offering except tax. And you basically can run everything through browsers, through SaaS. So it really means you need very minimal uh, local resources. If you are using hosted or SaaS, your desktop and laptop upgrades are a lot uh, less frequently needed. And your local computer technology becomes a lot less dependent uh, on the applications. In other words, you know, you can use about any computer and do your work fairly effectively. So, Jonathan, have we given enough time that most people have been able to get in on this poll? Absolutely. Okay, I just shared the results and 98% agree that it's all of the above. Yeah, understood. And it really is. Uh, certainly, all of these do work for you. Well, I got a few more uh, technology things uh, before our time today runs out. Uh, a few of you are printing in the field, and I had the good pleasure of discovering this thing. I thought it was a pair of hockey pucks when I walked up to it because I was looking at the back side of it. But it turns out it was a printer. Uh, it's about the size of two hockey pucks stacked up, uh, $200. You can just lay it on a piece of paper, and it will print the image on a piece of paper. It's a very interesting very, very small portable printer. So if you're trying to do things portable, that might be a way to get there. Another piece of technology that I'm very excited about is Windows 10. Uh, today, I am, I've been running on Windows 10, and I'm running with Office 2016. So I've been running the, uh, the last beta of those versions since they've come out. Uh, the official ship date for Windows 10 has now been set as July 29. And uh, Windows 10 has some very interesting uh, things for us. Uh, one of those items, for example, is a new start menu. So the new start menu is pretty straightforward, and I'm going to do something a little squirrely for you here. I'm going to break out of my presentation, and I'm actually going to use the, the new start menu. And uh, you should see a menu that kind of pops up that's got uh, what looks like icons in Windows 8. And then you can see that there's a place that you can get to your apps down the left-hand side. And again, I'm trying to scroll slowly enough that that's refreshing. But this is the new Windows 10 menu. Uh, all of us who are on Windows 7 Professional and uh, those of us that are on Windows 8 will get a free upgrade on this Windows 10 when we're ready to take it. It seems to be very fast. It seems to be very secure. Uh, there's some benefits in that, uh, you know, we can... Uh, slam our applications into the corner so you'll notice that it is possible for me to simply choose to um, place items either in a corner or take over the full screen. So uh, I hope that's refreshing okay for you from afar because I know sometimes on go to webinars the screens don't refresh at quite the right rate. But you'll notice that this allows me to split a large screen four different ways quite effectively. So we've got the new start menu. We've got this ability to have universal apps, applications that can run on phones and tablets and on computers. And we can actually hand the applications off uh, back and forth. I've actually had a number of questions this week about uh, vendors who are going to write universal apps. So you can run from a computer to a phone and back. The, the plat new platform is very smart about working on a two-in-one or a pure tablet. Uh, I've recommended to a number of practitioners this year that they consider some of the very inexpensive two-in-ones as a mobile platform. And we've had quite a number of discussions around the Microsoft Surface 
uh, you know, Pro 3 and the new Pro 4 that will arrive over the summer or the less capable Surface Pro 3 that's available now. Looking for a very simple tablet that if all we're going to do is run out of the cloud, we don't have a lot of need for a lot of sophisticated computer locally. And by the way, when it runs as a tablet, uh, it runs quite differently. And I've noticed the last patches here in Windows 10 and Office 2016 clearly are uh, more touch friendly. We'll be able to run multiple desktops as well. So it's the ability to run two or three or four things and switch our views. That's very helpful. But the piece that I demonstrated to you is the on-screen application snapping where you can put four programs that are snapped into the corner of the screens and you can switch between the task view. I tell you, once I started using that, it was all over for me because we've taught many of you to do a Windows right arrow or a Windows left arrow to split your screens or a combination key to split it between two screens and so forth. Running one large screen uh, with Windows 10 and doing the on-screen application, on -screen application snapping, real big deal. The other thing that's happened is Microsoft has discontinued the Internet Explorer browser. They're now using a browser they call Edge. It's very Chrome-like. It's very quick. And uh, you can see and expect to see this is the default browser. Uh, Office 2016 will probably ship at the same time. We did not get a confirmation that Office 2016 is shipping with Windows 10. But I will mention to you that you should expect it to arrive together. A few final things uh, just to mention to you before we turn you loose. Remember that you and or your clients may have a deadline that has to be meet, met with the Europay MasterCard Visa requirement of the ability to read the chips in cards. That's by October 1. Now, as professionals, we don't expect you to get uh, you know, fees paid for with bad credit card, but your clients that accept credit cards, if they're not using a chip-based system by October 1, the liability for a bad card will be transferred to them away from the issuing merchant. So that becomes a pretty big deal. Uh, you know, Apple Pay is going to be compatible with the EMV standard. There will be some other pieces out there. And a few other interesting technologies to watch. There is a standard called A4WP or Ytricity. Uh, Intel and others have now made their chips available to run without plug-in power. In other words, wireless electricity. The Ytricity standard has uh, you know, been approved and lots of vendors are starting to deliver products in this area. You can expect recharging of cell phones, tablets, computers, up through electric cars using this methodology this year. It's a pretty big deal. So you'll see it under the brand name of Renzance. I'd like for you to watch for it. It's good enough to use now. And I've been watching wireless power, by the way, for about 35 years. I can't believe it's finally arrived. One other future technology to watch for is 5G cellular. Ericsson has both the hardware and software working right now to run 5G. It's very fast at 4.7 gigabyte. They believe that uh, they should have this pretty broadly deployed by 2020. They're going to standards committees uh, now during the summer to get approval. We'll see a few other improvements with what I call SkyFi, wireless internet. Of course, Google's helium balloons there I've pictured for you. Uh, Facebook has solar powered drones. Two different companies are putting up satellites. You can expect some wireless access to the internet through one of these four projects. And frankly, my favorite cell phone announcement of the year is Google's Project Fi. International cell phone coverage, $20 a month, $10 per gig of data. So for those of you using three or four gig of data, it's probably going to be about the same cost as your current uh, cell phone. We are asking you to stay away from home automation. Even though Z-Wave has been out for 10 years, the competitors Zigbee and Z-Wave are still fighting it out. So a lot of the home automation standards are not far enough along that we think it's, it's really ready. So every year I always try to have a piece of technology my wife and I agree to purchase. Last year it was my Lynx Concept Grill, which runs with a smartphone. This one I may not get this year. You can see it's got a couple of year delivery window, but it's called RoboChef. It uses robotic hands. It uses uh, 
motion capture to take a chef who's preparing a dish, captures that chef's hand motion speeds and so forth exactly, mixes all the same ingredients together exactly the way the chef would in a restaurant. And you basically can load the robo chef with all these different recipes and, and uh, food types. So think in your home, you can have a chef world-class meal, meal prepared by a robot. $15,000 is the probable price on that. So, you know, we've talked about a number of different things. Uh, a vendor out of uh, Israel, Salentium, has a noise-canceling item for the office. We're, you can see Brian Tankersley and I demonstrating here in kind of what we call the cone of silence. You may want to keep quiet about some of these things for competitive advantage. If you've got questions, we'd sure like to hear from you. And you're welcome to contact me at my randy at k2e.email. So, Jeff, I think we're about at time, and I need to roll it back over to you. Thank you, Randy. And we appreciate uh, everyone uh, uh, for your time today in attending Randy's session. I always find them uh, very interesting and always learn a new term or two. One that I did not know was Y-tricity. So I wrote that down so I can uh, learn more about that. Appreciate that uh, expansion of my vocabulary, Randy, with that new word. And um, with that, I think if you'll turn uh, control back to me, I've got one small slide just to kind of uh, wrap it back up. Thank you. You're and absolutely right. That was an error on my side, so it should be back headed your way now. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. And uh, let's see here. I'll go full screen. John, can you see my screen? Yes. John, are you there? Can't hear you. Randy, can you see my screen? Thank you. I for can attending. see your screen. Perfect. Okay, so we have a CPE survey that will appear uh, after you exit the webinar, so not to worry. And we'll send you by email within the next uh, few hours uh, towards the end of the day today on the East Coast. Uh, you know, and certificates will come out certainly within the next uh, day or so. Again, we want to thank all of you for uh, signing in and, and spending an hour with us. We want to also thank Randy once again for your insights. Always, always good to learn. Appreciate the survey and sharing the results. Uh, always good to learn what others are doing and to kind of see that rolled up uh, in, a, in a presentable format with your insights. So thank you, Randy, for your time today as well. Pleased to do it and so pleased to have so many of uh, the attendees with us and hopefully we'll see you around the country in the not too uh, distant future.